our next presentation, Co-Creating a Better World, What the United States Can Learn from China. It's being given by Ann Lee. She is an adjunct professor of finance and economics at NYU, a US-China economics relations expert, expert, and the author of What the United States Can Learn from China. Ann? Thank you. It's a joy to be here, and I have to say, that was a tough act to follow. So, uh, yeah, I'm not going to try to break out into song, but, um, but I have to say I really appreciate uh, the Schiller Institute for inviting me because uh, I really didn't know about them until they asked me last week to uh, give some remarks, and so after looking at the website, I was actually quite impressed with the work they've done. Um, I did not know what the topic of my speech was until last night when I was told that it was going to be <laughs> the title of one of my chapters in my book. So um, I literally just scribbled some notes on the subway ride here. But I will try to just, um, you know, speak as, you know, authentically and as unedited as possible about uh, this very important topic. And what I want to say is that I really agree with uh, a lot of the presentations that were made earlier about the risks we face in the world and the challenges ahead. I'd just like to add that I think really right now the greatest challenge facing us uh, is how to get U.S. and China to work as allies together as opposed to adversaries. Um, I say this because I know today at the Pentagon all the war games being played are against not countries in the Middle East, not against Russia, but against China. And I've spoken to a number of other people in the military who have studied at the War College in DC, and they do tell me that it's very imperialist in their instructions and that they are currently talking about uh, preemptive war. And for those of you who don't know what that's about, it means to strike an enemy before they are powerful enough to strike back. And that is the case today with the US. The US has the world's strongest military by over 10 times um, all the other countries collectively combined. We have over 1,000 military bases around the world. China doesn't have a single military base outside its borders. And so why does the US want to uh, target China as an enemy? Well, there's this concept in the military called peer competitor. And what that really means is that in order for them to justify spending uh, the trillions of dollars that they do on military equipment, they have to have a, a, a reason uh, to justify that kind of spending. And thus, China would be the closest peer competitor. Um, and even though China has never threatened uh, the U.S. in any way from any national security standpoint, per se, never try to uh, aggressively uh, attack us or, you know, uh, in any other, it's only been mostly cooperative or just reactive to the U.S. Um, the U.S. military is forced to think of China as an enemy by virtue of uh, these concepts and of various perverse incentives that exist today. So uh, the, the topic of co-creating a better world, I'd like to just move on to something more positive, um, is possible, but I also want to touch on, obviously, the, the many challenges to that. So clearly, in this world, um, we have some grave uh, problems that we have to solve, uh, ranging from poverty to uh, environmental destruction and obviously nuclear, thermonuclear war. And, you know, the best way to solve this is to combine the uh, talents of all the people around the world uh, and to work jointly and collaboratively because we actually do have all the technology, all the equipment to uh, take humankind to the next level. Uh, the processing power of computers today is just 
truly unbelievable. I was having a conversation with someone who was uh, a scientist at IBM working on Watson. And uh, back in 2011, I don't know if all of you are familiar with that, uh, IBM had come up with a software to compete on Jeopardy against two other the top contestants there. And their uh, software, Watson, uh, won the, the Jeopardy game. And this was the first time it's ever been done where a computer recognizes human language and can process you know, just enormous amounts of data that way. Uh, and that basically, uh, the computing power for that when they did that basically uh, required computers to cover the entire football field. Today, they've now created a Watson that is just you know, a square box um, and now can handle about 10,000 times more computing than Watson did back in 2011. So you can imagine how much uh, processing power and computing power is available at our fingertips to really solve a lot of major issues uh, and, and you know, take us to outer space and do all sorts of things so that there will never be hunger in the world and never be wars, but there has to be the political will to do that. So in terms of addressing poverty, right, we, we know that this is a major issue around the world. Still billions of people uh, live on less than $2 a day. Uh, people are dying needlessly, you know, people eating dirt. Um, this is frankly criminal, and, and when we talk about human rights, and you know, Americans are known for talking about human rights, I would say the first major human right is the right to live, and therefore, the right to live means the right to be able to have food and eat, and we have the ability to create enough food for the whole world. And so, what has China been doing on, in this field, right? China basically has, uh, in the last 30 years, uh, lifted hundreds of millions of people out of grinding poverty, not just in China, but clearly uh, in many parts of the world, uh, including Latin America and Africa and also in Southeast Asia. And they did it by you know, the tried and truth methods of first serving the basic needs of people, building infrastructure so that people can get running water, people will have a roof on their heads. You know, these are the basic building blocks in order to build a civil society. And, and that's what China's done, and that's what the, the previous speakers had talked about. Um, and what has the U.S. done? I mean, these were actually millennial goals uh, that were put out by the U.N. And, um, and in fact, the U.S. hasn't even addressed poverty here in our own country. Uh, it's actually, you know, the people living in poverty is actually increasing as our middle class has been shrinking. So why? Uh, is there no political will to do this when this actually uh, is a real basic human right and there are groups right now, including you know, Human Rights Watch and others who are trying to redefine what human rights is. And just as an aside, the whole idea of human rights and free speech and all that was used as a propaganda campaign um, when we were in the Cold War and the people who thought up this idea was used to try to create dissatisfaction uh, when in the Soviet Union um, as a way to delegitimize uh, the Russians. But uh, I would say that this whole idea of human rights needs updating and that what we need is to really recognize that food security is a major important thing. And so, so back to the U.S., why is the U.S. not really addressing this? In fact, uh, there was a report that came out recently that even 40% of college students are food insecure right now, um, which I find absolutely criminal. I mean, these are kids who are going to school and they're worried about where the, their next meal is coming from. Um, partially is that when you notice people having to work harder, having to work three jobs to make ends meet, uh, just you know, having no leisure time, that makes a more pliable population. That makes for people who don't have the leisure time to read books and have leisure time to understand the issues facing the country. And so when people are at this stage where they only have time to basically work and sleep, that gives enormous freedom to a lot of the policy makers 
to ram through policies uh, that go unchallenged by the population. And so that is, uh, I have to say, a, a, a not pleasant secret of what's really going on behind sort of the thought processes of the people who uh, use benign neglect of this very serious issue. Uh, regarding uh, environmental damage, climate change, I mean, it's very clear that, uh, you know, a lot of scientists have agreed that we are experiencing major changes in our atmosphere. We have melting uh, polar caps. Uh, we've got trash, uh, you know, uh, floating islands the size of Texas, you know, three of them in the Pacific Ocean alone. Um, there is major environmental degradation and we need to do something about it because it is causing extinction at a mass scale. Um, and we could be at a tipping point if we don't do something about this. Uh, what has China done? Well, China, clearly, as everyone has uh, said on Western media, that they're the largest polluter. And in some respects, uh, you know, they are a very large polluter. But this is because they had also become the manufacturer of the world. So if they're manufacturing for the entire world, well, all the pollution is concentrated, obviously, in one country. Um, and uh, it was very clearly stated in many other economic reports that, uh, you know, easily uh, close to 50% of that pollution alone can be attributed to the U.S. because it was U.S. companies that decided to arbitrage and uh, avoid following environmental regulations in the U.S. and manufacturing in China instead and then uh, shipping them back here to Walmarts and other stores. So, um, so, so obviously it's uh, not exclusively China's problem, but China is taking lots of steps to try to address it. Uh, they have, uh, you probably have heard, been the largest um, uh, maker of solar panels. They have the largest installation of solar panels over their buildings uh, throughout China. Uh, they have higher uh, gas mileage standards for all their cars than the U.S. They have spent more on wind technology than all the other countries in the world combined. And um, they are, uh, you know, working on developing this whole new uh, renewable city uh, concept. Um, and they plan to try it in three pilot cities in Hebei, Tianjin, and Beijing, in which everything about the cities will have to be renewable and reusable. Um, and so this is where they're going to design ways to like, grow agriculture on the sides of buildings vertically, uh, where you know, all the data, you know, paper, whatever, is all going to be recyclable. And, I mean, it's a massive undertaking. I've seen some of the blueprints for this, and it is truly you know, on another scale of thinking. Um, and you know, this, is, this is stuff that can be done here in the U.S. if we chose to have that political will to do it, but I haven't heard any, you know, whisperings about that yet. Um, so why is the U.S. Um, not kind of joining in on, on China on some of these initiatives? And I would say that um, it was really telling when I uh, had a conversation with Ambassador Chaz Freeman. He's retired now, but he basically said that the reason why the U.S has not passed any legislation trying to, uh, you know, cap carbon emissions uh, to do any of this is because the U.S. military actually is the larger em emitter of uh, carbon gases and carbon emissions. And they see uh, this whole uh, debate about climate change and limiting carbon um, as a menace to national security. And so that is uh, a strong opponent to, to what the whole world has been really cl uh, crying out for to save the planet, um, but it's our military that's against the idea. Uh, so finally, how could we possibly stop the military, frankly? Um, they have almost an unlimited budget. And, uh, and I would say that this has largely been enabled um, by our currency regime. And uh, 
and I know not all of you are, are uh, you know, well-versed in uh, finance, so I'll try to give the most simplistic explanation for what this means. So back after World War II, uh, there was a new regime that was created out of Bretton Woods where, uh, you know, I think 44 nations got together to discuss how can we avoid another world war. And there was unanimous agreement that one of the reasons why we had world war uh, was because each country had different currencies um, and they were all trying to devalue at the same time to try to gain export advantage. And when you have a lot of countries basically having a currency war with each other, uh, all business across borders will essentially stop because businesses can't actually get a steady price signal uh, and cost signal to do business. Um, they can't afford to be doing business with another country if they don't know if they're going to make money uh, if the currency is going to change the price of the goods sold. So uh, that was one of the underlying reasons. And so they thought that the way to avoid that problem was by creating just, you know, one united currency and um, some sort of international currency. And this was proposed by um, Maynard Keynes. He was a British economist, a uh, very bright guy. And uh, this was opposed by the US. Uh, and the US sent a, a gentleman by the name of White who was, you know, he wasn't really a high level official or anything, but he had gone there to basically uh, propose the US version, which is that the US dollar become the world currency, as a world reserve currency. And uh, nobody would swallow that idea except for the fact that the US agreed to tie the US dollar to gold at $35 an ounce. And this would hold, this would be a way to um, act as a check and balance against US uh, runaway profligacy of printing money. And so uh, when that agreement was eked, then everyone basically had sort of a stable currency because they knew what everything, what you know, Deutschmark was worth and to the dollar, et cetera, et cetera, and British pound, and so forth. But of course, um, US policymakers got more ambitious about what they wanted to do because they were the sole military power. They got onto other military ventures such as Vietnam. A lot of the Europeans were becoming very uncomfortable with this because the US government was spending more and more on their military and they were very worried that there was not enough gold in the US to basically pay for all the dollars that, they were, being, that were being printed. So, uh, so many of these European nations were demanding payment in gold at $35 uh, an ounce uh, instead of accepting US dollars. And so much gold was flowing out of the US that finally President Nixon uh, famously created the Nixon shock where he announced to the world unilaterally that the US dollar would no longer be co uh, connected to gold anymore. You could not exchange the dollar for gold at $35 an ounce. And this created the current regime, and this happened in 1971, uh, that we have today in which the US dollar goes unchallenged as the world's reserve currency and, uh, and basically the majority of the world's transactions and trade happen in US dollars, whether or not the US is even party to the trade. This of course created a lot of nervousness amongst the European nations, which is one of the major reasons why they formed the Euro. Um, and this was, uh, you know, very much opposed by uh, American policymakers, but, and they were naysayers, but the Europeans, uh, you know, had the foresight, they, you know, had the political will to make it happen because they did not want to be subjected to this kind of American imperialism uh, of the US dollar, where uh, the US dollar would just go unchecked. And so, uh, Fast forward to today, um, what we have now is 
a situation where, you know, we saw the 2008 financial crisis. This was essentially um, banks and the Fed more essentially supporting the banks here, uh, creating money freely, and uh, because there's no check and balance on them, they can uh, make you know billions of dollars for per person for themselves, virtually by just you know hitting a computer keystroke, and and this is this is not creating value for uh, the real society for you know people around the world. This is just creating you know, fat zeros in their bank accounts um, so that they can amass more and more power to uh, influence policy and government, influence the media, and uh, influence education. And, and so I would say that uh, of these pillars of government, this currency in the Federal Reserve is actually like sort of a fourth pillar of government that um, was never in the Constitution, but has become, you know, part of the whole edifice here. And this ability to have uh, unique power to print money at our own will, so that we never have to really export to anybody. We frankly, all we have to do is just run the printer, the printing press, and just buy up whatever resources we want from the world, build as much military as we want uh, with you know, nobody to stop us. Um, this works hand in hand with the military, and so this is why the two sort of, um, you know, are very uh, dependent on each other. And so you would have to break one side before you can actually halt the other side. And the Asians actually n understand this very well, especially Japan and China, which are the two largest holders of U.S. treasuries outside of the Federal Reserve. And they knew that, you know, after all their hard-owned work and selling, you know, polluting their country and exporting all these finished goods to the U.S., they amassed dollars that were essentially worthless because even though they would hold, say, $3 trillion, uh, it would just be a flick of a switch and the Fed can just, you know, print $3 trillion and it would mean nothing. So, uh, so they were very worried about this and they tried to create their own Asian currency block. Uh, and I know this because it was a Japanese central banker that told me this. Um, before this whole uh, craziness around the South China Sea Islands and the Senkaku Dayu Island dispute. And I think that because they were so close to creating an, an Asian currency, much like what the Europeans did with the Euro, uh, that the US completely freaked out and has sort of instigated all these tensions uh, in Asia Pacific in order to um, make sure this development doesn't happen. So um, I don't know what the answer is to creating uh, a new currency regime because clearly there are very strong opponents to this. But uh, I would say there are many very clever people out there and uh, there would be no shortage of solutions, I'm sure, that would come to the forefront if more people understood this real nexus and what is really at stake. And so um, I just you know, like to conclude on, the, on a more positive note in that uh, even though the forces are enormous um, in trying to you know, produce reform in this country, uh, in order to uh, create a better world. Uh, Deng Xiaoping, when he finally came to power in China after Chairman Mao passed away, uh, he faced an even larger problem. I mean, China was, you know, three times larger than the U.S. and in a much worse shape. But he found 500 very devoted followers and with just a small cohort of 500 people has managed to completely transform China. So I'd just like to end on that note. Thank you. <laughs> just, um, you know, speak as, you know, authentically and as unedited as possible about uh, this very important topic. And what I want to say is that I really agree with uh, a lot of the presentations that were made earlier about 
the risks we face in the world and the challenges ahead. I'd just like to add that I think really right now the greatest challenge facing us uh, is how to get U.S. and China to work as allies together as opposed to adversaries. Um, I say this because I know today at the Pentagon all the war games being played. Our next presentation, co-creating a better world, what the United States can learn from China, is being given by Ann Lee. She is an adjunct professor of finance and economics at NYU, a U.S.-China economics relations expert, expert, and the author of What the United States Can Learn from China. Ann? Thank you. It's a joy to be here. And I have to say, that was a tough act to follow. <laughs> Over 10 times, um, all the other countries collectively combined. We have over 1,000 military bases around the world. China doesn't have a single military base outside its borders. And so why does the U.S. want to uh, target China as an enemy? Well, there's this concept in the military called peer competitor. And what that really means is that in order for them to justify spending uh, the trillions of dollars that they do on military equipment, they have to have a, a, a reason uh, to justify that kind of spending, and thus, uh, yeah, I'm not going to try to break out into song, but, um, but I have to say I really appreciate uh, the Schiller Institute for inviting me because uh, I really didn't know about them until they asked me last week to uh, give some remarks. And so, after looking at the website, I was actually quite impressed with the work they've done. Um, I did not know what the topic of my speech was until last night when I was told that it was going to be <laughs> the title of one of my chapters in my book. So, um, I literally just scribbled some notes on the subway ride here. But I will try to just say are against not countries in the Middle East, not against Russia, but against China. And I've spoken to a number of other people in the military who have studied at the War College in DC, and they do tell me that it's very imperialist in their instructions, and that they are currently talking about uh, preemptive war. And for those of you who don't know what that's about, it means to strike an enemy before they are powerful enough to strike back. And that is the case today with the U.S. The U.S. has the world's strongest military bio